thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Lila Anderson. I'm the Educator of Visual Literacy and Learning for University Museum. Uh, tonight's program is presented in conjunction with the exhibition A New World, 600 uh, BCE to 600 CE. That's in the hallway next to us, and we'll encourage you to have a look at that uh, at the conclusion of our program. That was curated by Pullman Fellow Sarah Bartlett. This, tonight's program is sponsored by the Kathy and John Howell Art Enrichment Program. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Rachel Mayers, is an assistant professor of classical studies in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. She received her doctorate from Duke University. Dr. Mayers teaches a variety of courses in the classical studies program here at ISU, as well as being an affiliate faculty member of the Women and Gender Studies program. She co-directs a summer study abroad program in Rome, Italy, that centers on art, culture, and history of ancient Rome and Italy. Dr. Mayers is a recipient of numerous awards and grants, including the Center for Excellence in Arts and Humanities at Iowa State University Research Grant, the Liberal Arts and Sciences Shake Shaft Master Teacher Award, and the James Huntington Ellis Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Introductory Teaching. Dr. Myers has diverse research interests in the material culture and social history of the ancient Roman world. Her scholarship is centered broadly on Roman art, architecture, and social history, and more specifically on women in the Roman world and imperial representation and propaganda. In addition, Dr. Myers explores the processes, functions, and values of the practice of benefaction. Her research encompass encompasses a large body of evidence including marble portraits and portrait statues, coinage, architectural monuments, written documents, and inscriptions. Dr. Mayers has produced publications on these subjects, just to name a few, on her own practices of female benefaction in the Western Roman Empire, the publication Ancient Society, the economic and cognitive impacts of personal benefaction in Hispania, Terraconesis, for the extra mercantile economies of Rome, or Roman and Greek cities, New Perspectives on Economic History of Classical Antiquity. That's quite the title. Um, among other publications. She is currently working on projects that document and examine benefactions by women across the Roman world and sculptural displays of the imperial family in Roman Hispania. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Myers for her talk, The Public and Private Lives of Roman Women. Thank you. Thank you for that very warm introduction. It is um, fun to, to be here since half of my teaching is online this semester. I really miss having the contact with actual faces. So it's nice to be here and to be with art. Um, and I, the, the topics that I'm going to be talking about today are very vast. And I kind of just um, took little bits of things that I like to talk about and and, um, that are interesting and wove them together with some of the pieces that are here that are part of the um, exhibition and um, definitely we'll have time for questions if you have uh, interest in something and want me to go into more detail I can definitely talk your ear off on uh, pretty much everything I'm going to be talking about today um, so here we here we go uh, maybe that's gonna work not going to work now. You were working a minute ago. No, come on. Man, we tested this. I was here early. Hang on. Um, there may be just one thing that I'm going to try. Because it did this actually in my class earlier. There we go. Friend, I have not much to say. Stop and read it. This tomb, which is not fair, is for a fair woman. Her parents gave her the name Claudia. She loved her husband in her heart. She bore two sons, one of whom she left on earth, the other beneath it. She was pleasant to talk with, and she walked with grace. She kept the house and worked in wool. That is all. You may go. So reads an epitaph from a woman's grave from Rome from the 2nd century BCE, 
presumably composed by the husband she left behind, it matter-of-factly sums up the life accomplishments of this woman, Claudia. And in doing so, it praises her for embodying the feminine characteristics Romans traditionally valued. She married, she had two sons, she was pleasant, she took care of the household, and she worked the loom. Messages like these can be found on hundreds of gravestones and in countless literary works, yet they certainly do not tell the whole story of women in the ancient Roman Empire. We can see that by examining only, not only the written word, but also the material objects left behind, women in the Roman Empire took on a range of roles in society in both the private and the public spheres. And I chose to start with an image here, actually, not of our Claudia, because we don't actually have her image, but of um, this woman Cornelia, who's known um, in some circles more by her male relatives. Um, her, her, um, all of the men in her life were very important in Roman history, um, and her two sons, Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus, uh, played some pretty significant roles as well in the late Roman Republic. And she was extolled uh, in, in our written sources for being this uh, virtuous woman who uh, had like a dozen children um, and, you know, bent over backwards to um, provide good education for her sons. And, um, and so she's, she's held up as the epitome of the Roman woman, much like our simple Claudia from the inscription. Okay, so let me start from the beginning then with Roman childhood. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the expectations of, of mature women as well. So we in fact know very little about the childhood of girls or boys really in the Roman world. For upper class girls, it was quite brief as girls married quite young, somewhere between the age of 12 and their late teens, um, who looked after their children depended on the family's social status. Most women from the lower class families nursed their own children and even took jobs um, caring for others' children as well. Affluent families either had slaves or hired nurses and nannies to help raise the children. Girls outside of the elite um, tended to marry a little bit later on, probably in their late teens or early 20s. Many families, again, from the elite, this is where we have uh, quite abundant information or more information. Um, some families would have provided some kind of education for girls, consisting of domestic skills and some reading and writing. Literacy beyond an elementary level, though, was a luxury afforded only to the daughters of wealthy families who had tutors in the home. The philosopher Musonius Rufus is one of the few who advocated for the education of girls and women, especially the study of philosophy, um, but as a way of enhancing their virtues and operating their households effectively. He writes, wouldn't the woman who practices philosophy be just and a blameless partner in life and a good worker in common causes? and devoted in her responsibilities towards her husband and her children, free in every way from greed or ambition? It seems as though, as a general rule, whatever education girls received was provided to prepare them to be better companions to their husbands um, and better mothers. Uh, their husbands were often eight to 10 or more years older than they and you know, uh, involved in politics and civic life. Some young women may have continued their education after marriage if their husband approved or was perhaps himself a poet, philosopher, or thinker or otherwise engaged in public life. Um, we have uh, a letter from uh, the younger Pliny writing in the early second century who's praising his third wife, Calpurnia. He writes, she is highly intelligent and a careful housewife, and her devotion to me is a sure indication of her virtue. 
In addition, this love has given her an interest in literature. She keeps copies of my works to read again and again, and even learn by heart. She has set to verses my, uh, she has set my verses to music and sings them to the accompaniment of the lyre with no musician to teach her, but the best of masters, love. Um, now Pliny is possibly exaggerating his wife's devotion to him, um, but what I take from this is that she, in any case, was educated and Pliny um, at least approved of his wife, uh, you know, having, having a, um, a more advanced literacy. Um, this, as with most of our surviving sources, the histories and the literature were written by men who uh, do not appear to have had much of an interest in the lives of young girls. Surprise, surprise. Um, but there are some archaeological finds that help us understand the toys and games that children played with. Um, and here's just one little wooden horse. Um, there we go. About 500 dolls dating from the 2nd century BCE through the late 4th century CE have been uncovered across the empire. And these are made from ivory, bone, terracotta, or cloth even, and they generally have bodies of adult women, mature women. Um, so some of these that are uh, brownish in color actually are ivory. They've just been um, discolored over time and because of the situation in which they, they, were, they were buried. Um, the dolls very often wear jewelry or have been found with miniature sets of jewelry made for dressing them up. And um, they often have very elaborate hairstyles. And as you can tell, most of these have jointed or articulated limbs, suggesting that the dolls were dressed and played with and not simply put on a shelf for display. Um, but that they were, you know, really uh, prized playthings. Another um, author, Plutarch, whose daughter Tamoxena died at age two, tries to console his wife uh, with memories of the girl, trying to, you know, ease her pain by bringing up all of the good times. Um, and he writes that their daughter used to ask the nurses to feed even the inanimate objects and playthings she took pleasure in as though serving them at her own table. I mean, these are things that just don't change. I think probably many of us who played with dolls or who have relatives young girls who play with dolls or young boys who are playing with different figurines. It's the same kind of thing, right? You have a little pretend tea service and, um, you know, it's these kind of little moments when you see we're not so different from these people who lived more than 2,000 years ago. This particular ivory doll um, that you see comes from the mid-2nd century tomb of a young girl named Creperea Trifana, which was found in Rome uh, at the end of the 19th century. Along with the doll were buried her accessories, gold jewelry, a gold diadem, a small ivory and bone chest containing pairs of ivory combs, small little silver mirrors, an amber distaff and spindle. Um, and so these are some of the finds that um, were part of this young girl's burial. Um, they've actually done some interesting work uh, because the bones of this young girl were found in the sarcophagus and able to see that she was probably a mid-teenage um, girl who, who died, but who had these uh, childhood emblems buried with her. The, the doll, as you can see, sports quite a fantastic hairstyle. Um, it's actually the style that the empresses and elite women wore in the middle of the second century, such as Faustina the Elder here, who was wife of the emperor Mark, uh, sorry, the wife of Antoninus Pius. Um, and so some of the dolls have very individualized features. Others are a little bit more um, stylized or schematic. And if you haven't been 
back to the far back case, um, there's uh, this little doll here, uh, which is made out of terracotta. And it's actually one of the few that I've seen that is in a seated position. And I'm not an expert in Roman dolls, but I've seen quite a few of them. Um, and so it kind of makes me wonder a little bit about her use. Um, her arms are pinned in a way that they would have been movable, um, and she still could have been uh, clothed in a variety of different garments or had jewelry attached as well. She's got um, a very typical type of hairstyle. It's called the melon hairstyle. Um, as I think you can probably see, it's sectioned into different plaits that are um, twisted and braided and then gathered at the nape of her neck in a bun. Um, it's a style that was very popular in the Hellenistic period and um, adapted by many Romans at various time periods as well. She does also have earrings um, that are integral to, uh, to the terracotta, so rather than added on. Um, there aren't any other signs of jewelry that are actually kind of part of the terracotta, as some dolls have, um, but it's possible that her owner had some different um, clothes or jewelry to, to outfit her as well. Um, terracotta is a very durable material. Um, it's also much less expensive and more abundant than ivory. So making dolls in terracotta meant that they were affordable to a wider um, portion of the population. Um, some scholars speculate that Dolls may have been particularly dressed up as brides. Uh, in Roman culture, the bride wore a very specific type of costuming um, with a particular kind of dress and veils and things like that. Um, at the very least, they definitely represent mature women uh, who are all done up with very well-coiffed hair, with jewelry and in clothes. And so in that way, these dolls reflect women of a particular social standing who were supposed to devote time to their appearance and whose place in society could be ascertained with just a quick glance at them. The Romans were very status conscious and had um, clothing that could designate which kind of class, although it doesn't really fall into our upper and middle lower classes so much, um, but clothes could really define the person. And so with this, I'm talking about the Roman concept of cultus, which literally means cultivation and can have quite a few different meanings. Um, but here, what I'm referring to is a range of activities under the, the rubric of self-improvement, so specifically grooming and personal hygiene. Women were expected to maintain their appearance, which reflected not just on them, but on their husbands, probably more importantly, at least for the husband's perspective. Um, Livy, uh, the historian Livy, in his discussion of a set of sumptuary laws, which had been uh, passed at the uh, kind of towards the end of the Roman Republic, Middle Republic, and, um, states that a woman's appearance and her finery could serve as a badge of honor for her husband, a sort of feminine display of glory, just like men's political triumphs were their own uh, badges of glory. So a woman's clothing and jewelry were outward signs of her husband's wealth. A woman's elaborate hairstyle indicated that she had the free time to sit around and have her hair curled and crimped and cut and dyed and braided or even supplemented with extensions and hair pieces uh, by a team of slaves, of course. 
So for example, this relief carving, which comes from a larger family tomb uh, nearby Trier in Germany, shows a woman sitting in a very fine wicker chair, and she's got one serving woman behind her who's working on her hair. Another one is, the second one is holding a little perfume flask. The third one is holding up the mirror. And then a fourth one is there standing by with a pitcher of water just in case her mistress gets thirsty. Um, right? So, you know, this is an indication of, hey, this lady can just sit around for hours and have her hair done and get all dolled up. She's got a whole lot of slaves, which is to say her husband was very successful, okay? Um, and uh, afforded her this opportunity of, of leisure and luxury. The wives of the great households in Rome and around the empire appeared to do little besides supervising their staff of slaves, yet the air of leisure, as I've just mentioned, um, probably masked the kind of social duties and public responsibilities that actually fell on them. Although the ancient sources did not consider these activities as entailing effort or expertise, we should acknowledge the impressive administrative and managerial skills of these women. The household was the locus for the production and the maintenance of many goods and services, um, specifically the spinning of fibers and the weaving of cloth, as I mentioned even in the, the first um, funerary um, inscription uh, that I mentioned. They also made certain products like um, olives and cheese for the household consumption. The matron of the household had to check all of the records and, and the supply rooms and make sure that items didn't spoil or get stolen. We know that looms were generally set up or often set up in the atrium of the household so that weaving was done in full daylight um, and then could also be seen by people passing by. Um, so this is just kind of a generic plan of a Roman household with the entryway over here. And the atrium was a room that would have been open. So imagine like all of these slats in this room disappear and they're just open. The ceiling would be open and you would have all of the sunlight come in. But being also right in this front room, anyone walking by on the street would be able to look in and see, oh, look at the productive women here. They're weaving wool and making garments for the family. Um, you know, women are always praised for their woolworking abilities. Um, so that relief from Trier that I just showed um, sends the message that this matron has plenty of time to sit around and primp as I said, implying that the household is very well run and that her husband provides financially for the family. But if we dig a little bit deeper, we actually see that this is a pretty well rehearsed motif and idea. And um, we might question whether this is reflecting a reality or more of an ideal, um, especially because images like this appear in funerary art, a genre in which the family is going to want to leave the fondest memories of the deceased, make the family look good. Um, so for example, on this particular relief, this also comes from a grave, we have a butcher shop here, okay? So we see our butcher over here. He's got a big cleaver, I guess, various cuts of meat. He's wearing a very utilitarian uh, short tunic here. Um, doesn't wanna have a billowing uh, toga or anything like that to get in the way of things. But then we have this woman over on the left who's sitting in quite a fancy chair, feet up on a stool. Um, she's dressed very nicely. She's got very elaborate hair too, as you can see. Um, very similar to the doll, in fact. And she's writing on what looks to be some kind of a wax tablet. 
she keeping the accounts of the shop? Is she meant to be the owner of the shop and the butcher is a slave? Um, is the butcher her husband? But she's depicted as a learned woman who's, you know, got the time to get all dressed up and she is educated. Um, we, we don't know exactly how to interpret this. Uh, and here's another example of a man who is uh, painting some pottery actually, and there's a potter's wheel in between him, sitting on just a very simple little stool. He again has a short tunic on. And then the woman opposite him is sitting on a fancier chair and she herself is wearing a nice dress and has her hair done. Um, and she's holding a couple items that might refer to goddesses like Ceres, um, a bunch of grain, for example. Um, and there are a number of different reliefs like this that, you know, we don't have a full story here. We've got just these images and we have to kind of wonder what might be going on. Is this in fact reality? Is it some kind of an ideal? Perhaps having your wife seated in all of her finery ends, uh, lends kind of a respectability and uh, domesticity to the scene. Um, well, everyone can come up with their own interpretation. Um, women were known to take on professions themselves. We do have um, some different evidence that women were engaged in various professions. It was generally not any kind of a glamorous work or it wasn't like empowering, like, yes, women can work too. Um, they were generally not um, very popular jobs or very rewarding. Um, however, we do see that with certain groups of people, um, they were an accomplishment and they were something to be proud of. Certainly not for the elite women, um, but for other uh, classes in Roman society. And funerary art, again, is where we can turn for some um, turn for some information. We do find examples, as I said, of families very proud of female artisans, such as this one, which is part of a uh, relief honoring a woman named Septimia Stratonike. It was found in Ostia, the port city of Rome. And here she is depicted in a very simple belted tunic. She's seated sideways on a low round back chair. And in her right hand, she's holding a shoe last, uh, a wooden mold around which the dampened leather was shaped in preparation for making a shoe. Um, unfortunately, she was not found with any leather shoes, but there are sites um, like Vindolanda, which is in England, that have um, provided numerous examples of a whole range of leather shoes and sandals, both male and female varieties. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about then, kind of a going along with this, um, getting all dressed up and having your hair done, is makeup. And we have recipes for cosmetics from a few different sources, though these are, again, male authors who might not be privy to or understand all of the intricacies of women's regimens. We hear of creams containing ingredients such as pounded narcissus bulbs, poppies, honey, recycled incense, myrrh, fennel, dried roses, and barley water. Um, Pliny also, by the way, beauty tip here, he mentions that cucumber juice and vinegar are good for removing freckles and other spots, which seem to be a major concern. Um, makeup would have been applied over a pale foundation. Rouge in the form of ochre, cinnabar, or sediment from red wine, brightened cheeks and lips, dark powders from soot adorned eyelashes or lids, saffron and ash could be used as eyeshadow. 
Most marble portraits that we have don't retain the pigments that they were generally often uh, painted with, but we have um, good evidence coming from Egypt in the form of these painted panels that are from a particular area in Egypt um, where the conditions were great in the dry desert to preserve these painted panels. Now these would have been um, part of a mummification, a mummy, mummified um, remains of an individual. Um, usually painted on wax, either with um, a tempera paint um, or, um, oh wow, my brain just slipped. Anyway, tempera paint was common um, or using um, paints and then sealed in with wax, which is why the colors have remained so vivid. And in these portraits, we really get a sense of what these uh, women looked like, and we can see the hairstyles, the jewelry, um, some indications of how they groomed, you know, big eyebrows, thin eyebrows, you know, all of those different um, kind of trends in beauty um, that we can see from these, uh, these different portraits. We know that cosmetics and creams could be mixed up at home or supplied by shops using ceramic or glass perfume vials, mortar and pestle sets, ointment jars. There are, in fact, um, several unguentaria um, uh, perfume vials. Here's a kind of an assortment of different products that have been found um, from Pompeii. Um, in particular, different uh, makeup applicators here. Um, and this, the picture doesn't look all that alluring. Um, that is like 2000 year old face cream that was excavated uh, in London in the early 2000s. So they found this little jar that actually still had the face cream and you know the finger swipes in there. Um, they, scientists determined that it's like half animal fat and half starch doesn't sound very great. Um, that kind of goes along with some of the recipes that we have found for the various cosmetic products. Um, and here are a few of the objects in the Bernier collection. Um, the, these are unguentaria, these different um, vials over here, which could be used for um, perfumed oils. Um, a little bowl like this could have been employed for mixing up something at home. And there've been different kinds of application tools that have been found in a number of different excavation sites as well. One occasion on which a woman might have made sure to look her best was at a dinner party. Um, I know some of you were here a couple weeks ago for Dr. Hollander's talk on dining. Um, and although it wasn't great for Greek, respectable Greek women to participate in uh, formal dinner parties, it seems as though Roman women did um, attend dinner gatherings with their husbands. We have a wall fresco like this one from um, Pompeii. It shows men and women on dining couches. Uh, this must depict a scene from later on in the evening uh, because this guy here is uh, relying on his slave to help keep him up on his own two feet. He's probably had a little bit too much to drink. Uh, another slave right in the center is offering either like a glass or a silver chalice to the guy on the end who is possibly getting his feet rubbed or washed um, by yet another slave there. Can't see too many of the other uh, dining vessels here, the kind of um, serving ware, uh, but there's a variety of different glass objects that are on display in the next hallway, a variety of bowls and pitchers um, like these ones and other fancy serving ware would have been brought out for gatherings such as these dinner parties. Um, this 
A uh, little blue cup over here is called a patella cup, I'm guessing because it looks like your kneecap. Um, and cups like that might have been used not only for uh, drinking vessels, but also for holding sauces or spices or other condiments. Surely women also organized their own parties. We have one letter from a woman named Claudia Severa to her friend Lepidina, inviting her to her birthday party. Um, and this, like the leather sandals, this letter comes from the site of Vindolanda, um, which was a fort along Hadrian's Wall in northern England, where the Romans um, occupied this area for about three centuries. So on the, this um, writing tablet, the text reads, On the 11th of September, sister, for the day of the celebration of my birthday, I give you a warm inv invitation to make sure that you come to us to make the day more enjoyable for me by your arrival, if you're present. Give my greetings to your Karyalis. My Ilias and my little son send him their greetings. I shall expect you, sister. Farewell, sister, my dearest soul, as I hope to prosper and hail. So the salutation sister here is really meant more as a term of endearment, um, probably not necessarily a blood relation. The last two phrases, which are over here, um, this is Latin, by the way, it looks like chicken scratches, um, but it's Latin. <laughs> the last two phrases are actually written in a different hand than the initial lines of the letter which suggests that while a scribe, a professional scribe, penned the main text of the letter, Claudia Severa herself signed off with her own message. And if that's correct, this is one of the earliest known examples of writing in Latin by a woman. Sulpicia Lepidina, the recipient, was the wife of a man named Flavius Cariolis, the prefect of the ninth cohort of the Batavians stationed there. And this birthday invitation is one of two letters that she'd received from Claudia Severa. So with this, we have just a tiny peek into the lives of the wives of these military commanders in the forts along the Roman frontiers. And certainly there were numerous other women socializing with each other and making the best of their lives in isolated and dreary and cold places. I mean, Northern England, right? Um, these letters hint at the real deep affection for each other and suggest the ways in which they staved off boredom in these outposts. Um, the flip side of all of this cosmetics and getting yourself all nice and so forth um, is that we definitely see some negative aspects to this. So Latin authors really make it impossible for uh, women to balance out the, um, you know, looking nice and presentable and the excess. Uh, there are comments about the weak female mind seduced by expensive jewelry and exotic textiles. Uh, cosmetics and wigs were a trope among moralists, satirists, elog elegists, and historians alike. There's an extremely um, derogatory poem by the poet Horace that talks about this woman's damp cosmetics and makeup dyed with crocodile dung. Yeah, doesn't sound very appealing to me. One area in which women were active in the public sphere is within a religion. Participation in processions and offerings got women out of the house and gave them some jobs in organizing and administering the, the cults of the various gods. Although today we tend to see religion as very separate from civic life, the Romans emphatically did not. Women could serve as priestesses for dozens of gods in the Greco-Roman pantheon, as well as in the worship of the imperial family. Particularly well known are priestesses of Ceres, Venus, Juno, Diana, Vesta, Minerva, and Chilestis. 
Um, so being a priest was very different from uh, being a religious official today. They were typically appointed for a fixed term, maybe a year, maybe five years, um, and they didn't have like extensive training at all. Pretty much it seems like to be a priestess, you had to have a sterling reputation and loads of money because one of the main uh, requirements or one of the main jobs was to uh, sponsor banquets and feasts and games for the public. Okay. Um, sometimes... Uh, or maybe a way of thinking about priestesses is thinking about um, like society women today who might serve on different boards of civic groups or charitable organizations, make an appearance at benefits and galas and underwrite some of the um, events with their financial resources. But priests and priestesses did uh, enjoy a variety of different privileges, such as having good seats at the games, permission to wear distinctive dress or other uh, trappings particular to the priesthood. Um, here is a statue of Eumachia, who was a priestess in Pompeii. She doesn't have any particular um, distinctive dress or attributes here, though it's possible that um, attributes could have been painted. Um, you can actually tell her hair has been um, painted. Uh, her covered head may indicate performance of sacrifice and that thus indirectly relate to the priesthood, but it may also be a sign of modesty um, expected from women in public. This other statue is also of a priestess from Pompeii. Um, we don't know uh, really anything about her, but we can see that she is a priestess. She wears a pretty distinctive headdress. Um, not only does she have uh, a, a like a wreath but she's also kind of got these wrapped bands around her head as well and in her um, hand she's got a small little incense box as well One aspect of Roman women's lives that I am particularly interested in is their philanthropy Women of the financial elite from all across the empire engaged in a wide range of civic munificence, which often could be linked to carrying out a priesthood, but was not always the case. Um, in fact, our Eumachia is known to have um, financed a very large building on the Forum in Pompeii. Um, we don't know if it was necessarily because of being a priestess or if it was before or after. Um, um, but she definitely dished out quite a lot of money to have this large and fancy building right on the forum. We have evidence that both individuals and families financed public works, buildings, statues, um, monetary foundations, and various forms of entertainment, such as games, banquets, and other uh, types of performances. Uh, I'll share a few of my favorite examples. During the first century CE, a woman named Corellia Gala Papiana bequeathed gifts of 100,000 sesterces each to the towns of Minturni and Cassinum. Now, 100,000 sesterces is a pretty good amount of money. Um, and she set up these foundations so that pastries and sweet wine could be um, provided annually on her birthday to the people of her town, which I think is an awesome way. If I had hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would definitely do this myself. Um, so she uh, sets up these funds, which would have been invested and then provided delicacies for years to come to the people of these two towns in Italy. Uh, and these are, in fact, some of the largest uh, recorded sums for any kind of public feast sponsored by a woman in the Roman Empire. Um, and the fact that she set up an endowment is an illustration of desire for lasting recognition, right? Because every year they're going to say, hey, we get Papiana's cakes today, right? And they're going to remember her and her family. Um, 
let's see, there are various examples of women um, spending quite a lot of money for different uh, temples. In fact, the most expensive temple that we know about in one of the Roman provinces of Spain was sponsored by a woman, 200,000 sesterces, which is a pretty incredible amount of money even for a temple. Uh, we have another woman going back to Italy, a woman named Umidia Quadratilla, who uh, sponsored uh, an amphitheater and a theater, and then had a very extravagant tomb as well in this town. Uh, we actually know about Quadratilla from uh, a letter uh, by Pliny, in fact, where he, he knows her grandson, and he talks about, um, you know, Quadratilla, she, she died, she was almost 80, and, you know, she was, um, she had a strength and firmness of body unusual even to matrons in their prime. And uh, she had a ton of money left over in her will, which she bequeathed to her grandson and granddaughter. Um, and Pliny goes on and on about how this woman, while she did some great things publicly, privately, she like had her own troupe of um, actors. Uh, it's usually called pantomime, but I don't think it's quite like our pantomime. And this was kind of scandalous for women to even like watch these performances, but she was very careful not to let her grandson watch the performances. So anyway, this quadratilla seems like quite the character. Um, there were also tons of statues all across the Roman Empire. It's probably one of the most common things we think of as far as Roman remains. Uh, lots of marble and bronze, but there's also a category of donation that I like to refer to as the fancy statues, such as a statue, which of course doesn't survive. We have part of the inscription though, not as flashy, let me tell you. This woman named Vibia Modesta from the Spanish town of Italica. Uh, dedicated a statue, and the inscription says the statue was made from 132 pounds of silver, and then it was adorned with an array of jewelry, a pearl pendant earrings, 40 gems, eight sapphires, a gold crown encrusted with jewels, so yes, very fancy, right? And as I said, we don't have the statue, but I can show you some random Roman jewelry, just to kind of get you thinking. Um, so the types of benefactions that we have around the provinces give us a little bit of insight into what maybe the townspeople wanted, or at least what the donor thought people wanted. However, most of these acts of civic munificence were not motivated by necessity, if that were the case, we would just have a bunch of utilitarian structures and essential services, which is not what we have. Um, there certainly would have been a number of factors that motivated benefactors. Um, Pliny the Younger, again, he was very prolific, if you haven't gotten that idea yet. Um, he himself was a benefactor in his town of Como in Italy. And um, he says that he was partly motivated to uh, provide for his town because of his desire to be a role model to others. Some elites probably viewed these donations as a way for their families to maintain their power and wealth, to keep their reputations positive so that they can maintain their political alliances and, and have their memories um, you know, last in their towns even after their deaths. So uh, we've just kind of run through a number of different aspects in the public and private lives of Roman women, very much complicated by the lack of reliable ancient texts. Um, and then the bias of what does remain is mostly for the lives of the wealthy um, and not for the lives of the majority of people in the Roman Empire. Um, so I am happy to answer any questions you have if there's anything else you want to know more about. Thank you.